today's world, defeating terrorism has become the dream of people all over the globe, regardless of their race, gender, nationality, or faith. However, a single universal approach to defeating terrorism could never be sufficient. This is due to the fact that terrorism has many different forms and people from different cultures and backgrounds, as well as states and governments have been guilty of it. Analysts and researchers have proposed a spectrum of approaches to tackle the problem effectively. Terrorism will never be eliminated unless we deal with the root causes. If we keep on treating the symptom instead of the disease, then we should not expect any progress. Therefore, the disease has to be diagnosed first in each case, and the root cause of every form of terrorism has to be identified in order to combat it. What it takes to solve the issue is greater public understanding of the true causes of suicide terrorism. Uh, right after 9-11, uh, we had a very unusual circumstance. We had a new threat, suicide terrorism. We had almost no knowledge in the academic community, not just in the public, but in the academic community. And suddenly, people had to have an explanation. Well, they came to an explanation, which is they were Muslims who did 9-11, therefore it must be Islam that's causing suicide terrorism. Turns out that's just simply wrong. It's a false assumption, and it's terribly important to educate uh, publics and leaders about the true causes of suicide terrorism. Does that mean that then publics and leaders who simply give in to terrorist demands, give them whatever they want? No, that doesn't mean that at all, and I'm not claiming that they should. What I am saying, however, is that a better understanding of the true causes of suicide terrorism will encourage governments to come up with alternative strategies in their own interests to achieve their aims in better ways. The key point is that many, many terrorists are not mindless, irrational individuals. They may engage in acts which we deplore. They may use violence against individuals which we deplore and for which they should be criminally punished. But they are motivated by, in some senses, some of them, some of the time, a form of rationality which points to some serious political reasons. Uh, the number one thing to do is to take the circumstance away that is producing suicide attack, which is um, uh, ending the use of ground forces uh, threatening territory that terrorists prize. Uh, or another way to put it is ending foreign occupations of Muslim countries. If acts of injustice and occupation are the major provoking factors behind suicide terrorism, then why do so many governments fail to take the appropriate action in dealing with these causes? One of the reasons why governments have been failing in their efforts to combat terrorism is the fact that they did not gather significant knowledge into its patterns and causes. Before the attacks of September the 11th, there wasn't a single database of global patterns of suicide bombings. Robert Pape started to create the first database of this nature, which was not published until 2003. After 9-11, uh, there was a tremendous amount of fear, a tremendous amount of hatred, tremendous amount of anger, and that emotional uh, energy uh, uh, was going to be uh, uh, very important uh, in leading governments to take actions. But if you marry that deep set of emotions with an absence of knowledge, that's the worst of both worlds. That's the worst situation. So what we can do more than anything else to combat this is actually public education. Many vicious acts are committed under the banner of jihad, as well as many crimes are committed in the name of war on terror. But neither can the first be considered as jihad, nor the second can be considered as war on terror. Crossing the red lines will turn both of them into acts of terrorism. Classically, Muslims who lived under non-Muslim societies religiously were bound to observe the laws of those societies as long as they did not contradict any major, major pillar of faith. And secondly, they were forbidden to engage in acts of violence 
against non-Muslim societies. And that covered two scenarios. Number one is the citizen of that society, and number two is a visitor to that country on a visa. So you have a great classical legal jurist, Imam Ibn Qudama, who in his book al mughni says very clearly that a Muslim who enters a land of the non-Muslims or a Muslim who lives in the land of the non-Muslims is bound by a treaty of peace and security as long as his rights aren't violated. And the overwhelming majority of Muslims who reside in non-Muslim lands have that understanding and articulate that understanding. From an Islamic perspective, ends do not justify means. By that we mean that there are two important conditions to consider any self-sacrifice of that nature acceptable Islamically. One is the purpose, secondly are the means used to achieve that purpose. As we said earlier, the purpose of repelling aggression, resisting oppression, and restoring peace, even if it requires self-sacrifice, is our acts of heroism, like all armies in all countries consider them to be. So the objective must be just, it should not be unjust war. But that is not enough. And I repeat again, ends or good ends do not justify any means, which means that the means of achieving that must be legitimate. And as mentioned earlier, uh, civilians or non-combatants should not be hurt. You're, so you're only fighting against the aggressors, people in, in uniform who are killing, pillaging, and destroying. You cannot violate any of the ethical code of combative jihad in Islam as has been described earlier. So you need these two conditions and that's where the confusion arises that some people are driven by the perceived sense of injustice done to them or their brethren that they forget that you don't have to have only a just cause but you have to follow the ethical means also. So one would naturally ask how can these misconceptions of Islamic ethics of war be challenged and corrected? The root cause of terrorism has been linked to a number of issues, economics, uh, politics, uh, social issues. My experience firsthand in dealing with people who have been infected by that virus is that this is a, a, a disease which is rooted in thoughts. And the way that you combat thoughts is with more powerful thoughts and ideas. And my experience with with a few uh, youngsters who were initially influenced by that, that, that strand of thought was to sit down with them, talk with them, walk them through the potential outcomes of those choices that they were making in light of what the Prophet has taught us, in light of what Islam has taught us, and Alhamdulillah, all praise be to, a God, to God Almighty, I can attest that all of them changed their minds and changed their ideas. The people who are affected the most are the innocents. They are also the weakest. You see, one of the problems we have with states using terrorism is that states are the strong actors, and they're using the terrorism or the violence against not just innocents, but weak innocents. It's they're the weaker side that are being uh, typically harmed or bombed in this case. The Quran says, and what is the matter with you that you fight not in the cause of God and for the weak, ill-treated, and oppressed among men, women, and children. What did we say the weak are suffering from? Terrorism. Therefore, according to this verse, the word jihad does not equal terrorism, but rather war on terrorism. Jihad means war on terrorism, the real one. Combating terrorism committed by any entity, whether individual, organization, or a state, is a form of jihad. After giving jihad and Islam strong consideration and, and taking the time to invest in understanding a religion like Islam, and, and that's something that Muslims and Christians, as well as Jews, Hindus, people of all faiths, atheists, have to take the time to invest and cultivate an understanding of each other. After doing that, I would hope that someone will be able to look at jihad and Islam and see it as a means of removing oppression, uh, as a means of removing uh, the plight of the poor, those who are exploited by others, and come to a conclusion ultimately that we are going to shape this world according to how we believe our ideas and act on those ideas. 
So it's a challenge, especially in recent years, for us to move beyond these stereotypes, to work to assist each other, live together in an equal fashion and respectable fashion, and pray to God dearly that He'll bless us to, to live in the footsteps of the prophets and the great leaders and righteous people who preceded us. In the words of Martin Luther King Jr., injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Surely Muslims were not, are not, and cannot be angels for 14 centuries. Like all faith communities, they had their own shortcomings, which is one aspect of being a human. Meantime, it has been the testimony of many that Muslims as a faith community fared quite well historically and comparatively speaking and contributed immensely to human civilizations. They did not stop at tolerance, but they were even more accepting. And acceptance is a concept that is deeply rooted in the Quran and the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. These true, undistorted teachings are precisely what humanity need today. Let us join hands in pursuing what we all need and aspire to. Peace, justice, equality, and an all-embracing sense of human brotherhood. If we want an earth restored without war and without the threat of war, we need to understand that we are all humanely equal. One innocent victim in London or New York is the same as one innocent victim in Gaza and Kabul. The 21st century has led humanity to a new phase in its existence. It is a time when we are able to communicate throughout the planet. We are able to share information. We are able to cross barriers of race, ethnicity, and politics. And so in a sense, we are one human family. So if there is injustice in one part of the planet, there is injustice all over the planet. If peace is established in one part of the world, then peace can be understood and felt throughout this planet. Let us work together as a human family. This is a great opportunity for humanity, or it could be a terrible time of calamity. Since terrorism is a result of injustice and oppression, if people come together in a unified effort to end them, then we will definitely see the end of terrorism.